I'm here going to talk to you actually about prostate cancer and more advanced prostate cancer and some of the extremely exciting uh, research uh, that we've um, uh, been involved in in Ottawa and we've had huge improvements in, in, in prostate cancer and advanced disease and metastatic disease in castrate resistant prostate cancer and that's all happened in uh, just the last sort of seven years or so and it's through huge trials uh, that have been done worldwide which again Ottawa uh, participated in uh, where these advances have been made um, and it's been very exciting to be participating in those trials uh, it's been a huge group effort between the uro oncologists the medical oncologists and the radiation oncologists and our patients uh, in ottawa to be participating in those and i'd like to share some of those advances with you um, there's numerous trials that i won't even be talking about or presenting probably another 20 that we're participating in currently uh, which again i'm confident a lot of them will actually improve outcome um, so, the talk tonight is again on metastatic prostate cancer, uh, both newly diagnosed metastatic disease and, and pr metastatic prostate cancer which is resistant to hormone therapy or castrate resistant. And there's been a big change in landscape uh, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, disease state. Does anyone know where that is, the picture on the, the top? It's Sturgeon Creek. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually, uh, that's uh, Kauai in Hawaii. That's uh, where... Um, no, Manitoba. No. <laughs> Not Manitoba. No. That's Kauai. It's along the north shore of Kauai. It's where, um, uh, what's the, uh, the King Kong was filmed there? No, Jurassic Park was filmed there. That's a pretty cool place to go. If you do get to go there, it's a pretty neat place. they got a cool hike along there. Trials in prostate cancer. I'm a huge believer in trials. Actually, probably roughly a third of patients in my practice are on a clinical trial. I'm the biggest believer in trial, or biggest proponent of trials, I think, at the Cancer Center. <clears throat> trials are really critical for improving survival, advancing patient care, in some cases, again, reducing toxicities of treatment. Uh, they offer cutting edge treatment to our patients in our region, and we are one of the top occurs in Canada on trials in the Ottawa auto region. I'm very proud of that, uh, that our trials department uh, has been very active in trials. And it also raises the bar for our whole hospital. Uh, you, we are able to attract excellent oncologists. As a result, we're able to train our residents and fellows <clears throat> so they can, again, go out to other centers and uh, participate in trials. And I think it's really key, uh, key to be able to be participating in trials. Um, so looking at metastatic prostate cancer, you've probably seen bone scans like the one on the right there. Um, so most time when prostate cancer metastasizes, it metastasizes to the bone. Um, standard of care for metastatic prostate cancer has been since the 1940s, hormonal therapy, originally with surgical castration, uh, but then subsequently with LHRH therapy. Um, so these are medications that simply block testosterone. We know prostate cancer feeds off testosterone. It's like a nutrient for the cancer, causes it to grow and spread. And it's actually quite gratifying actually treating patients who have metastatic disease with hormone therapy because within a month the patients are often feeling much better. If they have bone pain, weight loss, uh, poor appetite, nausea, a lot of those symptoms get better fairly quickly when you start patients on hormonal therapy. Unfortunately, the hormone therapy cannot cure the prostate cancer. It'll get it in remission for a period, on average for about uh, two years. Um, some patients it responds as long however for five to even ten years. About ten percent of patients who have metastatic prostate cancer are still responding at ten years. Um, so there's been a lot of effort in metastatic prostate cancer to look at novel new treatments then to improve outcome, improve response duration and that's what this talk is going to be largely on. Um, average survival for people with metastatic disease is about three to four years, but there's a huge range and there are prognostic factors to determine who will do better than others. Unfortunately, eventually the prostate cancers actually develop resistance to the standard hormone therapy. We call that castrate resistance. So you might have heard that term before, castrate resistant prostate cancer. Um, once um, a tumor becomes castrate resistant, patients are often running into a problem within one to two years of that and unfortunately are often passing on at that point from their cancer. And again, there's been huge effort in trials, and I'll present some of those, in the castrate resistant metastatic disease in terms of improving outcome, improving quality of life, improving symptoms, and improving survival. Uh, accounts for a significant amount of deaths worldwide, castrate resistant prostate cancer. So beyond sort of hormone therapy, beer and wine are always good options. Um, 
I like wine personally, but uh, the beer option looks quite good here, actually. <laughs> so traditionally, uh, since the, I think it was the early 90s, um, we, our standard treatment actually has been taxatier chemotherapy for patients who have castrate-resistant prostate cancer. So once the cancer has stopped responding to hormonal therapy, once it's become resistant to that, our standard treatment was taxatier chemotherapy. Uh, and that was based on two huge trials. One was a Canadian-led trial, Ian Tannock, from Princess Margaret Hospital. Again, we participated in that trial. It was a TAX-327 trial, and it showed about a three-month survival advantage if we used taxatier compared to the best chemotherapy of the day, which was an agent called mitoxantral prednisone. So taxatier, um, again, became the new standard of care for patients who had resistant disease, again, based on a trial done a few decades ago now. Um, and then for the longest time after that, we just did not have any other new options. We had supportive care and palliative radiotherapy, things like that we could offer to patients. But for the longest time after the publications about the benefits of tax care, we just had nothing happening, unfortunately. Um, Issues with palliative taxotere, about half of patients roughly are eligible for chemotherapy or taxotere when the cancers become resistant. So that means there's about half the patients who actually aren't eligible because of uh, performance level or other medical problems. Because again, a lot of people with metastatic prostate cancer are in their 65 through 80, 85 age group and they might have other health conditions which precludes chemotherapy. Uh, so roughly half the patients in Canada historically have had resistant, uh, castrate resistant prostate cancer wouldn't receive taxotere chemotherapy. So it was really a need for new novel treatment strategies that we could offer pretty much all the patients. And it was a really cool discovery. Uh, the Royal Marston, which is a very famous hospital in London, England, they discovered that once the prostate cancer cells become resistant to standard hormone therapy, what happens is the cancer cell itself uh, actually starts producing its own testosterone. It fools the body. So the cancer itself starts producing its own testosterone and very high levels of it, which drives the cancer to grow and spread. Uh, they also get mutations within the testosterone receptors within the cell. But most importantly, again, the cancer itself actually starts fooling the body, says, I don't care what you guys are doing with your hormone therapy, I'm gonna just start producing my own. I'm gonna start growing independent of that. And so what they also found is, well, they found, discovered, looked at enzymes and things, and they found, well, we found a, a, a drug called Zytiga, or abiraterone, which actually blocks the production of testosterone by the cancer cell. It also blocks production of testosterone by the testicles, as well as the adrenal glands, but most importantly, it actually blocks the production of the testosterone by that cancer cell, which had sort of outsmarted the body. Uh, so it blocks an enzyme called KIP-17. Don't, don't worry, there won't be a, a biochem quiz later. Um, importantly, the Zytiga, it not only blocks testosterone, it actually blocks cortisol production. Cortisol is basically the body's own steroid. So everyone has steroids in their body. We need it to survive. You hear about steroids as a bad thing. Well, you actually need steroids in your body to survive. So the, the abiraterone or Zytiga, it also not only blocks uh, production of testosterone, but it also blocks production of cortisol. So you'll see anyone who's on Zytiga as a medication for prostate cancer, they, we have to replace the cortisol with a medication called prednisone. So just physiologic replacement of what the body needs. Uh, if we don't, you can actually get some funny side effects from the, the medication, so it's really important for patients on Zytiga to get this cortisol replaced. Um, there were some very exciting trials that were done, again, worldwide, which were suggesting very good, strong activity of Zytiga in patients who were resistant to chemotherapy and who are resistant to hormone therapy. And those trials, those preliminary trials, which has suggested very good activity of the drug, good palliation of symptoms, improved survival, led to a definitive trial where we compared placebo. So these are patients, again, who'd had hormone therapy, they had metastatic disease, they were resistant to that. They'd had chemotherapy with taxotere, our best chemotherapy, and the patients were then randomized to either prednisone, which is actually an active treatment against prostate cancer, or Zytiga and prednisone. And that's called the 301 trial. And that was published a while back now in 2011, so three years ago. Uh, this was a huge randomized trial. Uh, again, on the trial, uh, all the patients had castrate-resistant prostate cancer, uh, had metastatic disease, and they're randomized to this medication, abiraterone or Zytiga, with prednisone re replacement versus prednisone. And they followed patients along. 
and lo and behold, there was a big survival advantage. So about, uh, I think it's three and a half, four months, survival advantage with the abiraterone. But also importantly, it actually palliated symptoms. So patients who had bone pain, who had fatigue, who had loss of appetite because their cancer was progressing, had a very important improvement of their symptoms. So not only it improved survival, but it was excellent palliation of symptoms. Uh, that was huge. So again, for since the early 90s, we had nothing. And finally, we have a medication which is well tolerated. This is a well tolerated medication. It's an oral agent which actually, again, improves symptoms, it improves survival, it delayed radiographic progression, in other words, progression of disease in the bones, um, and we did some quality of life evaluations, and again, the patient's quality of life was better in these trials. Uh, so we got PSA responses, you got objective responses in terms of if they had tumors in the, in the liver, et cetera, lungs. So again, this is a game changer. This was a huge game changer. We now had a new novel treatment uh, for prostate cancer, which was advanced, which was resistant to our standard best treatments with hormone therapy and chemotherapy. It actually led some brilliant uh, researchers in California to look at, well, if we can block the production of testosterone with abiraterone, well, maybe we could somehow not just block the production, maybe we could instead actually block the binding of testosterone to its receptor, okay? Uh, so a bunch of brilliant guys in California came up with another drug called MDB3100, it's now called enzalutamide, uh, and they basically uh, came up with a drug that not, doesn't block the production of testosterone, but it very potently inhibits the testosterone binding to its target. Because what happens is testosterone produced in the body, normally it then binds at the prostate cancer like a lock and key mechanism to a receptor, and then that receptor testosterone complex goes to the DNA, which turns on the cancer cell to do all sorts of nasty things, grow, spread, etc. So this drug, enzalutamide, basically blocked that lock and key. It was a very, very, very potent binder. You've heard of the drug Casadex? Well, that does that, but much less potently. It's not nearly as potent as enzalutamide. So again, it, uh, this is just as a schematic what it's doing. It's essentially blocking the, uh, the binding of the testosterone to, the, to its receptor, and there's a downstream effect. Um, so the huge trial, again, we participated in this trial in Ottawa, uh, which looked at, again, that same population that we looked at in the patients uh, on the original abiraterone trial. So again, patients who'd had metastatic disease, who'd failed hormone therapy and failed chemotherapy, uh, looked at the same population. So we randomized patients to enzalutamide versus placebo. Um, and what we found is, again, about the same level of survival advantage as abiraterone. Again, a, a several month survival advantage. It delayed bone complications from the prostate cancer, the need for palliative therapy, reduced the risk of uh, bone complications like fractures from the prostate cancer. Again, uh, delayed progression of the disease in the bone. Uh, again, both the abiraterone and uh, enzalutamide, they're well tolerated medications. Like compared to taxotere chemotherapy, or other drugs that we historically use for other cancers, these are extremely well tolerated medication. There can be side effects, but again, in the trials, actually, the benefits in terms of improving quality of life and improving symptoms are typically far outweighed by side effects, which are relatively minor. So we did have this patient population who, who failed standard hormone therapy, who just can't get chemotherapy. So there's clearly a need for treatments for that patient population. And if these medications, these intensive hormone therapies, you are useful once tumors become resistant to standard hormone therapy and have failed chemotherapy, well, it makes a lot of sense. Well, why don't we just use them earlier? Why wait till the patient has chemotherapy? Why don't we just use these more intensive hormone therapies, Zytiga and enzalutamide, earlier once the tumor becomes resistant to the standard hormone therapy? Why, why give the patient chemotherapy when we have other much more effective agents or better tolerated agents. So that led to two trials. One's called the 302 study, which is looking for, that was the first trial done. That was looking at the benefits of Zytigo in the pre-chemotherapy setting. And the other one's called Prevail, which is looking at, again, enzalutamide before chemotherapy is used. Um, so the 302 trial, this is, again, in patients with metastatic prostate cancer who are failing standard hormone therapy. We now have the mature results from that trial, the, the long-term survival results. Again, in the trial, uh, all the patients had to have uh, basically uh, castrate-resistant prostate cancer. 
they've had standard hormone therapy and progressing, they have metastatic disease, and they're randomized to prednisone versus uh, abiraterone and prednisone, or zytigan prednisone. Uh, what we found is that there was a doubling of the time to progression of the disease in the bones. Okay, so that's a really huge benefit in terms of uh, delaying symptoms. Uh, there was about, again, a, a five, almost five month survival advantage, which is bigger than what we saw with chemotherapy. Originally, Taxotere improved survival by about three months. This is five months. It's better tolerated than Taxotere. Um, and there was dramatic delay in the radiographic progression of the disease, in other words, the cancer progressing in the bones. Again, very favorable safety profile. Some of the patients on this treatment, on average, are on it for about 18 months. But some patients are on it for two to up to five years. They're tolerating it well. So with long-term follow-up in this, this, this intensified hormone therapy or novel hormone therapy, this is a well-tolerated uh, medication. There, there can be side effects. It does need to be monitored by an expert oncologist or your, your own oncologist. Uh, but it's, again, typically well-tolerated. In that 302 trial, the initial Zytiga trial in the pre-chemo space, uh, prior to chemotherapy, again, huge delay in terms of PSA progression, progression in the bones, delayed the need for palliative chemotherapy, de de delay in performance status decline in other patients were functioning better longer term, delayed need for uh, requiring opiates or like ca uh, cancer uh, pain medications, narcotics. So these are all important endpoints, not just a survival advantage, but all the other very important palliative endpoints that we look at in oncology, and are, which are important for patients, they were all, uh, again, improved. Um, so, there's a, so they did this trial with uh, abiraterone, they also did it with enzalutamide, and that's called the PREVAIL trial. Uh, that was just presented this spring. We participated in PREVAIL as well in Ottawa. So our patients were on this trial and actually benefited from the PREVAIL trial. Again, uh, similar to the trial I just presented, patients all were, had metastatic disease. They all received um, either enzalutamide or a placebo. Again, delayed progression of the disease, a survival advantage, uh, and delays need for palliative chemotherapy, uh, delays time to PSA progression. So basically, the similar endpoints we saw with the abiraterone, we're also seeing with enzalutamide. So comparable benefits. Um, reduce the risk of bone complications, again, just like in the uh, abiraterone trial. Again, fairly well tolerated medication. Enzalutamide can cause some fatigue, some joint pains, rarely some uh, slight alterations in LFTs, mild hypertension. Typically manageable side effects. We rarely see grade three or four side effects, which is, again, not unusual when we're treating with intense chemotherapy. We rarely, with enzalutamide, or Zytiga C, uh, se severe or life-threatening complications. So it's well tolerated. Um, so right now in Canada, um, what's basically approved and funded if we look? Well, after chemotherapy, well, we can use abiraterone or enzalutamide. They're both approved and funded. So those are available options after chemotherapy. Uh, in the... Um, there's another medication called Radium-223 or alpha radon. It's Health Canada approved. It's not funded currently, but we have it available in trials. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that later. It's a radioisotope, which has kind of a unique treatment for prostate cancer. Um, currently, in the, before chemotherapy is used, in other words, once the cancers, again, become resistant to standard hormone therapy before we use chemotherapy, currently Zytiga is, is Health Canada approved and funded. Enzalutamide, the other medication, is currently not funded. It is Health Canada approved. We are waiting for funding. So there's been pretty huge changes, again, in patients who are, have metastatic disease. Uh, we have now a series of options that we can use uh, both before and after chemotherapy. What about, there's, we just heard, presented this spring, information on a different population uh, how about patients who present who have metastatic disease? Why don't we just intensify the treatment right up front? Why wait till the cancer becomes resistant to hormone therapy? Why don't we use some other more intensive treatments up front? Move the treatments earlier, maybe we'll have bigger survival advantage. Well, they did a trial, this was started a long time ago, it was called CHARTED. And it was looking at, well, we know prostate cancers, once they become resistant to hormone therapy, they benefit from taxotere chemotherapy, our best chemo. 
Well, why don't we use the tax tier up front in patients who can take it? In other words, patients who are younger, good performance level, don't have significant health problems. Maybe if we intensify the treatment with hormone therapy and chemotherapy, we could improve survival. We do that a lot in other cancers, like in breast cancer, standard treatment for most women with more advanced breast cancer is actually hormone therapy and chemotherapy, one of which, one of the agents which is quite effective is taxotere in breast cancer. They're both hormone responsive diseases, they also respond well to taxotere. So what we did is we did a trial called Charted, which is looking at, well, maybe we can intensify that treatment for so that patient, don't wait for them to get resistance to hormone therapy, let's use hormone therapy and add the taxotere. Um, there's also a trial we've just completed, we don't have any data out of it, it's called Latitude, which is, well, rather than intensifying the treatment with the hormone therapy, let's use the Zytiga earlier. So we're using uh, standard hormone therapy with or without Zytiga. In that trial we just finished, we participated in it, I don't have any results from that one. But we do have results from Charted, which are quite exciting. So Charter was presented at ASCO this spring. ASCO is the biggest meeting of oncologists in the world. There's about, I don't know, 35,000 people who go to that. 35,000 oncologists from all over the world go to this meeting. Um, much more, uh, actually, oncologists than there are patients on the trial, interestingly. <laughs> so in this trial, uh, again, this was patients who presented with metastatic disease. They've not been on hormone therapy, and they're treated with standard hormone therapy with or without the taxotere. Huge survival advantage. This is huge. 44 months going up to 57 months. That's really a big survival advantage. Um, and when you looked at people with extensive metastatic disease, so they broke, broke down patients and people with minimal metastatic disease versus those with extensive metastatic disease. And those with extensive metastatic disease had an 18 month, a year and a half survival advantage by adding the chemo. That's huge. Again, they selected the patients. These were patients who were good performance level, didn't have significant liver disease, heart disease, etc., kidney disease, because you got to have to, you want to be able to give treatment to patients who can take the treatment. Again, you got to be careful who you treat. But again, a huge survival advantage. Um, there was other important endpoints. Uh, this trial hasn't actually been published yet. We are, will wait for all the mature results from it, like in terms of the actual published when we get a publication. Has been presented at ASCO, and actually we are now treating some patients with this treatment, even though it's. It could, the data is so strong and it's from a very good cooperative group uh, that's run this trial, so we know the data is true. So we've actually changed our practice in Ottawa. Not everyone in Canada has. We, we looked at it as a group. We were very confident with the results and we've actually just recently changed our practice. So we are offering this to, to some patients who have metastatic disease up front. The side effects actually, again, because we were treating the appropriate patients on this trial, it was actually a well-tolerated treatment. Uh, very few uh, grade um, three or four side effects. The commonest side effects are effects on the blood count, so you do have to be careful of monitoring the blood counts. Involves six, three, two, three weekly cycles of the taxotere. Um, so I think again, hopefully we're gonna get that actually as a published thing soon, and I think it's gonna, again, be just a complete shift in treatment paradigm for patients who present with metastatic disease who have metastatic prostate cancer. Again, a new new treatment, we're just moving the treatments up front earlier, and this will improve improves outcome. Um, so another treatment uh, trial that we participated, we were the lead occurrer in this in Canada, was a, looking at a novel radioisotope. Uh, again, this is for people with metastatic prostate cancer, so people with bone metastases. This is not an appropriate treatment if you have lung or, or liver metastases, it's not gonna have any impact on that. Radium-223, this radioisotope, uh, basically it lodges in act, uh, at weather sites of active bone metastases. Um, so radium-223, if you go back to your science days, I can hardly remember mine, but um, some of you probably remember yours better than I do. It, it's in the same line in the periodic table as calcium. So calcium we know goes to the bone, it gets laid down in the bone it's, uh, to solidify the bone. Radium basically is in the same line, so it basically localizes or lodges wherever there's any cancer cells within the bone where there's active bone turnover. So it lo localizes there. And what it does is it actually then emits an alpha particle, which is a very potent radiation treatment, but not a broad radiation treatment. It actually localizes the radiation, delivers radiation within one to 10 cell diameters 
of where it deposits. Okay, that's pretty pretty precise. <laughs> I don't think I can get that precise with my radiation treatments. Uh, but it basically, what it does is releases this alpha particle, which then damages the DNA of the tumor cell. Um, so it causes double strand breaks, which then causes lethality to the adjacent tumor cell. So wherever there's active bone metastases, wherever the cancer cell is active there, delivers extremely localized radiation there, eradicating the bone metastasis. The fact that it's so localized, therefore there's very minimal side effects to the radium-223. We used to use other radioisotopes in prostate cancer occasionally. They were called strontium or cerumen. The problem with those is they were beta emitters. So they would also localize in the bone where there's active bone metastases, but they released beta particles, which travel a lot longer. Also, the tracks of the radiation are a lot as densely, what we call ionizing, so you just don't get as much bang for your buck. And the problem is the fact that they don't localize, they do have effects on the marrow. So you can only do it as a single dose. And you could palliate symptom, or it could give palliation of bone pain, and you get some brief PSA responses. With radium-223, because the radiation is so localized and so concentrated and very lethal, you can actually do repeat dosing. So you can actually give this as a series of cycles once a month, basically. Which again, you would think, again, if you can do repeat dosing of something, maybe we'll get more bang for our buck in terms of palliation and possibly survival benefits. So this just shows as a schematic, um, if you do a, a, a strontium treatment, much broader range, the big circle there, in terms of effects on the bone marrow, whereas with the radium-223, it's extremely localized, so you just get localized cell killing uh, where, the, where the radium deposits. Uh, so we participated in a trial. Uh, I presented this at uh, the CUA uh, last, uh, uh, two years ago, actually, because uh, we were the lead accruer on the trial. Um, it was actually headed by Chris Parker, again, from the Royal Marsden, a famous hospital in London. Uh, so this is a worldwide trial that's called uh, Alsimka. And what we did in that trial is, again, to be on that trial, you had to have bone metastases. You couldn't have lung or liver metastases, again, because those patients probably wouldn't benefit from that type of treatment. Um, you have had to have had previous chemotherapy with Taxotere. Your tumor was resistant to hormone therapy, had had previous chemotherapy, the standard treatment, or you were just not eligible for chemotherapy. In other words, you weren't fit for chemotherapy. Uh, and you have had to be symptomatic. You are having symptoms from the prostate cancer the patients on this trial had needed palliative radiotherapy for their bone metastases, or the patients were actually taking narcotic, like opioids, or narcotic analgesics for bone pain. So these were a very sick group of patients that we were treating on this study. So they would had previous hormone therapy, previous chemotherapy, and they had lots of bone pain. So we randomized the patients. In a lot of trials would do a two-to-one randomization, so you have a two-thirds probability of getting the active potential active treatment, and about a third of the patients get placebo. And it's more palatable for patients if you have a two-thirds probability of getting the active treatment. The patients who are not on the active radium-223 got best supportive care, which we do all the time anyways. And the patients on radium-223 received the radium-223 uh, along with best supportive care. So how is the radium-223 done? Well, you go see your oncologist. They see how you're doing. They check your blood counts. Are your blood counts good? Good, they're good. Okay, get off five minutes up the hall, you go to the nuke med department, and they do it as an intravenous infusion, it takes five minutes. So an outpatient-based treatment, check your blood counts, you're okay for treatment, go to the nuclear medicine department, you get your radium-223. So a simple outpatient treatment. It's uh, monthly, um, and on the trial it was six injections. Why six? Well, that was because Taxotere. They use six, six treatments, so they thought, well, six seems like a good thing to do. Lo and behold, when we got the results of this trial, big survival advantage. Again, about a three-month survival advantage. Same survival advantage we actually saw with Taxotere originally. So this is a novel new treatment, very different than any other treatment we tried before. It's a radioisotope, uh, which actually improves survival. Um, the survival advantage was independent whether we had the chemotherapy or not. So the patients who weren't eligible for chemo, they were still benefiting. Uh, huge delay about a half a year delay in the next bone complication by using radio 223. So big delay and need for palliative radiotherapy or fractures, etc. So big benefit where you would expect it in terms of impacting on the bone complications. 
Uh, this is one of my patients on trial. Uh, we wrote this up. Uh, again, the pictures aren't very good for some reason. But anyways, a huge bone scan response. So you'd see bone scan responses. In other words, the cancers are melting away in the bones. Um, in terms of side effects, well, radium-223 can have some side effects, but it's extremely well tolerated. To be honest with you, I could not tell who was on active treatment versus placebo. That's how well tolerated it is. It causes some mild stomach side effects, so some mild diarrhea or nausea in a small percentage of people. No severe GI side effects. Why is that? Well, actually, after it's given through the intravenous, it localizes in the bone, but the remaining gets excreted in the gut. So it can cause some mild nausea or diarrhea as a result of that. There are still some mild side effects on the bone marrow, but again, you don't need to give transfusions or things like that. So you do have to monitor the blood counts and make sure the blood counts are, are, are okay. And that's it. So mild GI side effects and some mild um, uh, side effects on the, um, on the uh, bone marrow. So what we concluded in this trial is again, the radium-223, it improved survival. There was uh, big delays in bone complications from the prostate cancer. Uh, and it also, we did some quality of life measures in this trial and it did improve quality of life. It didn't actually, uh, in the trial, we looked at, so some of the patients subsequently needed treatment. It actually didn't limit your, your ability to have subsequent treatments, specifically palliative chemotherapy. So you could get subsequent treatment. Um, so, in terms of uh, what other trials are we doing, I mentioned to you we just completed a trial called Latitude. We participated in that in Ottawa. Um, so that is, again, we know that if we intensify treatment for people with metastatic disease, prostate cancer, with hormone therapy and adding Taxotir, well, maybe if we intensify the hormone therapy by adding Zytiga, that could improve survival as well. We know Zytiga has about the same survival advantage or even more than taxotere once cancers become resistant to standard hormone therapy. It certainly makes sense to move that very well tolerated treatment up front earlier and that's why we did the latitude trial. I have no data from that. We'll have it probably in a year to two years time that some data come out from that. Uh, the earliest data I'd say. Um, there's a trial we're currently participating in auto. It's called the ERA trial which is again for people who get early resistance to their hormone therapy who have bone metastases, well, we know a good, excellent treatment for that is Zytiga. We know it improves survival. We know it delays need for chemotherapy, etc. cetera. Um, so what we're doing is in that trial, all the patients get that active drug, Zytiga, and half the patients then get radium, the radium-223. And maybe there's good synergy. We know in advanced prostate cancer, if we treat patients with hormone therapy and radiation, there's good synergy for people who don't have metastatic disease. Well, this is a lo little bit different way of thinking about it. For people who have metastatic disease, we use a novel new intensive hormone therapy. Well, maybe they can get synergy with that other radiation type of treatment, which also works throughout the whole body. Um, so that's a great trial. Uh, we're the lead actually uh, in, in Canada on that trial. Uh, and it's um, basically just opened up. So we will be looking at accruing patients on that trial. Four or five years ago, we basically just for treatments outside of supportive care, we had hormone therapy and we had taxed here. Uh, now, post chemotherapy, we have Zytiga or abiraterone, we have enzalutamide, and we have radium 223. All these treatments improve survival, they all palliate symptoms, they're all well tolerated. Prior to chemotherapy, we have abiraterone, uh, which is again approved and funded. Uh, enzalutamide should be shortly uh, funded. Um, it's Health Canada approved. Uh, we are looking at, again, in the ERA trial, using the radium-223 or alpha radin earlier in the disease, combining with Zytiga. So that would be a nice option for our patients in auto to access. Um, yeah, so in the last, that's what my backyard used to look like not too long ago. Now I, I didn't get a picture of what it looks like now. So there's lots of changes in landscape here in Ottawa besides the clinical trials. Um, anyways, I, I'm waiting, I can hardly wait for the spring again. We'll be good. <laughs> um, so when I was asked to do the talk, I was also asked, is there anything that uh, the group here could potentially support? Well, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about clinical trials. I can be honest to say about a third of my patients are on trials. I'm a very big believer. I love to meet patients. I love to know what patients do. And the other thing is I always like to offer them a trial. So 
I'm a huge believer in trials, not just in prostate cancer, I also treat, I also treat brain tumors. And auto has been key in brain tumors as well, interestingly. Not that you want to hear about brain tumors, but we just got recently results of a trial in brain tumor that we had participated in like 15 years ago. And lo and behold, a seven year survival advantage. Can you imagine? Unbelievable. And we participated in that trial. Our patients benefited from that. We'd previously, in our most aggressive brain tumors, also been one of the lead accruers on a, a, another drug treatment for other, our most aggressive brain tumor. Again, huge survival advantage. Still huge room for improvement. Our, our five years survival went from 1% to 10% with that other treatment for this for this uh, the most aggressive brain tumors. So I'm a huge believer in trials. So not just in prostate cancer, but in trials. Uh, so... Trials are really critical for advancing patient care in all cancers. Certainly in prostate cancer, in the last seven to 10 years, we've seen huge advances for prostate cancer. There's so many other trials I haven't even mentioned in earlier stage disease where we see improved outcomes in terms of less side effects, optimizing survival as well for high-risk disease as well beyond before metastatic disease. There's been about a dozen trials, for example, show up for high-risk prostate cancer. If we add hormone therapy to radiation, the survival is, be is better. Um, it really offers cutting edge treatment for our patients. We're doing a lot of trials looking at improving our radiotherapy treatments in terms of much more cutting edge treatments. We had a recent trial using Cybernet for low risk prostate cancer. We participated, we were one of the top crews in Canada on that. Um, believe it or not, our, our trials office, however, is actually in a significant deficit. Uh, about seven years ago or so, we almost had to shut our whole trials office down. We're, we're a million dollars in deficit. Fortunately, we, through community fundraising, we, we actually cleared that deficit. Right now, unfortunately, our group, and we're one of the most active, is actually running a deficit. So the, each disease site actually uh, has their own budget, and we're in a deficit. So if you guys wanted to at all donate and make donations, I would suggest this. I'm passionate about trials. Uh, so uh, it typically is run through the Ottawa Hospital Foundation. But you, if you specifically want to help prostate cancer and trials research, it would have to go attention to the GU design, uh, disease site group with a specific cost center. That helps to offset costs. Some of our trials we, we do make a bit of money on, which offsets a lot of other trials where we lose a lot of money. For example, that radium trial, the LSIMCA trial, I'll just tell you, we were the top accruer in Canada. We lost about $30,000 on that trial. So half of a body. Like, you know, that's salary for half a person for a year. The trial benefited our patients. We see huge benefits. So that's my plug for the day. <coughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.